Good afternoon, everybody. When I uh, heard I got a two o'clock speaking slot, I figured that was fantastic. Good. I didn't realize I was going to be speaking to a room full of food drunk zombies. <laughs> so try to keep it uh, lively. Um, I'm Bob Dylan. I'm from Xperi. Uh, it's not a, a name you probably don't know. Uh, started at Ibiquity. We got acquired by DTS, Theatrical Sound Company. Uh, last year, DTS was acquired by a company you never heard of, Tessera, and we all rebranded as, um, as Xperi. Uh, I've been in this company and in the, at the intersection of radio technology and uh, automotive infotainment for the last 12 years. Uh, the people I know in broadcast say, excellent, you've been in the industry for 12 years. My friends from technology offered me advice and help getting my career back on track. Not supposed to be anywhere 12 years, but I am. Um, so we're building a, a product to um, deliver metadata to couple with radio audio broadcasts to create immersive radio experiences. Um, we're targeting it primarily at the car, uh, but it's not just applicable for the car. And um, <clears throat> there's some challenges with that, some technical challenges that go along with that. And I'll, we'll, I'll talk about those a little bit. But I want to start by introducing why are we doing this and what's the context for this and set up what the technical challenges are uh, that come from that. So we'll start with um, the evolution of the of, of user experience around audio. Back in the day, it was a it was a record player. There, it, you listen to you listen to audio. You know the most immersive experience you had was reading the liner notes and looking at the uh, the album covers. And uh, over the decades, we've come to where we are now with these multifaceted experiences around audio consumption. It's not just audio. It's videos on TV. It's album covers on your mobile phone. It's it's just this multifaceted immersive experience. Um, in contrast, uh, radio, the user experience, really hasn't changed a whole lot. What used to be uh, a dial and a couple of knobs is now a dial and a couple of knobs, uh, surrounded by some really interesting stuff. It's kind of like, like the old guy in the movie Up. You know, you're in that same little house, and the, somehow the city just grew up around you. There's exciting stuff going on around you, and you're still in that same you know, little old house. Um, this is, of course, a Tesla on the, on the right. Just to show you by way of contrast, that's what the rest of the audio experience is in that car. So for broadcast radio to remain relevant, we have to, um, we have to rise up to this. And we have to meet people's expectations. Unfortunately, people's expectations aren't being created and they're not, they're, their experiences aren't being set with a dial and, and two knobs, it's being set with mobile experiences, with web experience, with tablet experiences, with uh, uh, over-the-top TV experiences. And so, uh, if radio is to remain relevant, we have to we have to match that experience because that's what people expect. So, what is the difference between these audio experiences and, and those audio experiences fundamentally? And the answer is metadata. It's not just the audio. It's the, the equivalent of the liner notes. It's the, uh, it's, it could be artist images. It could be DJ images. It could be um, album images. It could be textual metadata. It could be information around, about um, what else is going on around you related to the music that you're listening to, about the broadcast many, many different kinds of meta information that people now come to expect to come along with their media experiences. And we have to meet that if we're going to remain relevant um, in the future. And, and I think we are. Um, you know, pe people talk about radio as a, as a dying media, and it's, it's not. Uh, when you have 100% market share, there's only one way you can go. Right? There's only one way to go. And we still enjoy you know, over 90% listening in the US. Across all demographics, people will tell you that uh, young people don't listen to radio. It's not true. Uh, Edison, you look at Edison research results and you find that uh, it's pretty flat. Everybody listens to radio at some point during the week. What they do after that, that does vary by generation. But um, radio is still relevant and there are good reasons for that. And so we want to keep it relevant. Now, this is not to say that the radio industry doesn't, doesn't use metadata. It does. 
just doesn't use it in the car, where people actually listen to radio. Uh, there's, there's different parts of, of radio today. There's the, uh, um, there's the part that people use the most, which is the broadcast in their car. And then there's the, the mobile and the web experiences, which is an emerging, fast growing, I don't mean to minimize it, it's important, but where people listen to radio today is still broadcast and is primarily uh, in the car. Certainly in the United States, that's true. Not true in every uh, place, part of the world. But broadcasters do use metadata. Um, many, many broadcasters all around the world uh, have individual station apps on, for mobile, Android and iOS. And in addition, um, majority of them will participate in various uh, aggregation platforms. In the United States, we think of uh, iHeartRadio, but there are uh, others around the world. And you'll, wherever you go, there's some form of aggregator um, doing digital streaming of, of radio content. Um, broadcast stations and, and, uh, and groups all have websites, and you can see, and that's, that just, I just grabbed that, that's Capital FM in London. A uh, tremendous amount of, of metadata that's related to Capital's primary product, which is their, their broadcast uh, service. And um, there are uh, syndication and affiliate networks all around the world, and those those syndications and affiliates generate tremendous amounts of, of, of metadata. Um, NPR has a, a distribution network, and one of the companies that we own, Arctic Palm, is involved in the distribution of that metadata. And uh, in countries where there are, uh, there are digital radio broadcasts, the US with HD radio, and uh, in uh, Europe and other parts of the world with DAB, um, metadata is an important part of, of the broadcast product, but, but it's still a minority when you look uh, at the global scale of, uh, of radio broadcast. So how is this me metadata generated? How do radio broadcasters generate this? Um, first and foremost is the broadcast operations themselves um, with the broadcast playout systems and automation systems. That's a really rich source of metadata. And um, all of these playout systems have um, some interface to them where you can access that metadata. Excuse me. Um, in Xperia, we acquired two companies over the last couple of years, um, Arctic Palm in Canada and All In Media in London, and they each have uh, a product for metadata generation for, for uh, broadcast and other use that's tied to uh, the playout system. So this is um, a place where there's a lot of metadata that's readily available, um, and the special purpose software I described that goes with it. Uh, the programming departments of the broadcasters generate a considerable amount of, of metadata. That's schedules. People, believe it or not, are still very interested in having schedules where they can uh, look forward, they can see what's going on uh, across the dial. Um, and the programming department uh, generates this for internal use, but in a lot of cases they publish it too. And in certain of these um, broadcast operation systems, it's, a, it's available uh, to import. Um, the programming departments uh, organize live events and uh, create metadata for those live events. And as well, they publish time-shifted versions of the broadcast content in the form of podcasts or you know, some sort of a canned audio uh, product. Um, and the digital groups within, within the broadcasters generate a lot of metadata. The websites that I showed you, um, that's the digital group. And social media is a huge part of promoting radio and, and creating communities around radio. And they do that by creating metadata and stories and pictures and events and lots and lots of stuff that's interesting. And so there's um, all of this metadata that's, that's out there that's, that's used to create the community for uh, radio broadcast and it's used to drive listenership, but it's not actually used to supplement the consumption of it. And that's the genesis of the problem that we wanted to solve. We wanted to take all of this metadata and create a rich, immersive experience in the car uh, and other platforms uh, around broadcast radio to compete and to meet people's expectations of what it is to consume audio. So, what are the technical challenges that, that, that this brings? Um, in, in many cases, um, we can work in major, and uh, let me just give you a little context. We don't, we don't think of this problem in terms of a single market. We think our challenge that we're trying to solve is globally, and we'll, st we'll talk in a minute why that is, but on a global uh, scale, 
um, we can work with broadcasters, broadcast groups, and aggregators, and we can get access to lots of data directly from the broadcasters. But you know, if you take the United States, for example, there's you know, 13,000 plus FM licenses, and you know, probably 4,500 of those are, uh, represent the vast majority of, of listenership and advertising dollars. Um, and you're not going to get to those numbers by going directly to the broadcasters, because it, you know, it's a long tail kind of thing, and you want all that content. So while you can work directly with broadcasters to collect metadata, it won't be enough. You will have to go out and collect it from the wild and organize it. Uh, yourself. And so merging that data from all of these disparate sources uh, is a challenge and trying to bring it together in a comprehensive way so you can create you know, this coherent uh, experience and make it easy for car companies to implement and use uh, is a challenge. It's, it's to use a, a cliche, it's hurting kittens. It's certainly hurting kittens. The second challenge is um, the fact that this is a global footprint. And the reason that it's a global footprint is any product um, that we would want to put this metadata in, that's cars primarily, but even mobile. These are global products now. You, you know, there is no American car. There is a, you know, global products. Any product you see on the road, and we all travel internationally, you see it elsewhere. And if it's not the same car, it is the same radio. Uh, the car companies want to build one radio and they want, to, they want to deploy it around the world, and that's what they're doing. And so we need to provide a global footprint where we can provide a single interface to a car company and they can get access to radio metadata anywhere in the world. Um, uh, and that's what we tell the car companies. You adopt our solution and drop your car anywhere on the planet and you're going to get some form of service. Um, and that's it, and, and that, that creates a lot of challenges. Um, both in terms of the technology, but in terms of working with the broadcast community. And because um, the broadcast community has technical differences and they have cultural differences and, we, and they have different business interests and different needs and we have to meet those as well. And the product has to reflect that. Um, second challenge <clears throat> is um, minimal data consumption. <coughs> Broadcast radio, one of the major appeals of broadcast radio is that it's free. Um, you know, there's, we, we, as we always said at Ibiquity, there's always a market for free. Whenever someone would say, what about satellite radio? You know, God bless, but there's, there's <laughs> a limit to how many people are going to pay you, you know, $15 a month. There's just, so um, there's always a market for free. And so as we supplement um, the audio broadcast, we we have to keep it free. We have to keep it very inexpensive. And in many cases, um, you know, so if, you know, if we were to start to consume as much data as streaming audio, what's the point of it, right? So we, we have to preserve that low cost aspect of, of broadcast radio. Um, and the way you do that is by m using minuscule amounts of cellular data. And uh, in a lot of cases, the car companies are including the cellular data with the price of the car. And so you're, you know, it's the car companies who's concerned about the data consumption of a service like this. Um, but even when the consumer is bringing their own device in and they're paying for the data, um, they're still concerned. And you don't want to surprise people. Uh, it's, it's funny how people react. But if they get a, you know, their cellular bill and they're over and you were to blame, it's, it's, it, it's going to be a problem. So we have to keep the data consumption low. All right. So how do we go about doing this? Well. Um, in the case where the broadcaster just sends you any kind of metadata you'd ever want, it's easy. But in the case where you don't have that relationship with the broadcaster or the data you get from the broadcaster is incomplete in some way, you have to go out and you have to get it and you have to bring it all together. And this is, uh, and the places you can go to get that is um, uh, government agencies. In, in some markets like the United States, uh, there's a lot of good information you can get from the FCC, uh, from, you know, from, just a, uh, from broadcast organizations. We can get good data. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, in a lot of the countries we deal with that are, that are interesting to our customers, there is no central, central place even to get an ID. Uh, in the U.S., we use the FCC ID for these stations to match up all this data. There is no FCC ID in Brazil, you know, they, so you just have to, you're on your own. Um, there are some standards that are out there. In uh, Europe, there's uh, Radio DNS, and um, it's good to a certain extent, uh, but it's, it's very incomplete. And uh, so you have to supplement that, and, and there's no, no easy way to do that. And then there's even commercial sources. Uh, just a simple example, Wikipedia is a very 
there's a lot of information about broadcast stations on, uh, on Wikipedia. And so how do you take all these different sources and bring them together into, a, into a one comprehensive record for, uh, for that radio station? It's, it's challenging. Um, and you know, we're, we're using, we're borrowing technologies from the internet for this. There's a lot of data science involved in this. Um, first of all, we have to scrub the data and we have to normalize it. Uh, you know, like in, in hip hop, every song is featuring somebody and it could be featuring, it could be you know, F-E-A-T period, it could be F-E-A-T-N period, and it all means the same thing. And that, you know, when you go to match stuff, that, that kind of stuff is, makes it really hard. Um, the internet with big data has gotten very good at that. And we're using those techniques and it takes that kind of data science to bring these sources together. Um, and then we, we do uh, probabilistic matching. We'll, we look at uh, all different as you know, any way we can. And frankly, we do this on a market by market basis. What we do in the US is not what we do in the UK. And what we do in the UK is not what we do in France. So um, you have to look at the market and say, well, what is it about this market that I can exploit to make all these connections between all this data sets that we have for each of these markets? Sometimes that has to do with location. If uh, a couple sources have transmitter locations, you can you know, use that to say, okay, these are the, these are the same thing. Um, you can look in you know, hot 97, hot 97, okay, that's probably the same thing. So you're looking for these, these markers, and generally speaking, those markers vary from geography to geography. So there's no one size fits all solution to this. Um, but you, you do have to do that and with the goal of creating a single comprehensive record for uh, each, for each of, the, uh, of the entities in your system. Which brings me to the next topic, which is uh, data models. And you know, data model, this is a, a term from, uh, from databases, and this is how you, how you organize your data and how you represent your data and how you access your data. And for broadcast radio, and usually that has to reflect the domain and the, and the problem that you're, that you're trying to solve. And uh, it's no different in radio. And so with our, you know, with, with Ibiquity, we've been in broadcast radio for, you know, the better part of 20 years, and so we know a little bit about um, radio, but we were, we were even surprised, you know, we just, because the United States is such a big market, it's easy to think that it's the whole world, and it's not. Uh, in fact, the United States market is unique compared to the rest of the world in the way we're organized, in the way, in the kinds of information that's available. Um, and market differences create network differences. And what I mean by this is uh, a comparison of, say the BBC with the BBC One will be a single, what we call a station, that'll have transmitters all over the place. So uh, you have to distinguish between the content and the distribution. And you have to identify, and you're gonna wanna reference each. So you have to track each individually and relate them to each other. Where in the United States, it's, um, you know, there, there's a very diffuse, uh, long tail commercial market. Um, with lots and lots of players that are in individual. So those are two very different um, networks. And so we, our data models have to reflect that. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this problem, um, around, we, we define a station as, a uni as unique content. Uh, for example, uh, BBC One. Uh, and and even, even this is, is, is a challenging definition because if you take uh, the United States, uh, iHeart may have a, a, a you know, Nash FM. Uh, but the commercials will be different in New York than they'll be in Louisiana on Nash FM. Is that, this, is that a station? Uh, so these are some of the things that we struggle with as we try to create these data models and we try to uh, fit them to, the, to, the, to what we find on the ground. But putting the details aside, there's about 70,000 unique stations in the world. It's a lot of stations. And broadcast, and where broadcast is a tower. It's a, it's, a, it's a signal in the air. It's a frequency at a location. And there's uh, about 170,000 of those uh, around the world. And um, you know, we have all of these in our system, and we're tracking all of these, and we're collecting as much data about all of them as we can. Um, but in terms of how you organize these things, you find permutations and combinations. So BBC One, you have one uh, station that's available on multiple broadcasts. Uh, Hot 97 in New York, the analog signal, uh, you have one station, one transmitter, one broadcast. But Hot 97 in New York, HD radio, uh, actually has two stations on one transmitter. You have the HD1, 
which is Hot 97, and the HD2, which is Hum Desi. It's a different station on the same transmitter. So your data model that, you, that underlies your system has to reflect this. You have to have the flexibility in how you organize the data uh, to access it. So now you've got your data organized, how do you distribute it? This is a, a very you know, a rough drawing of, uh, of, of the system that we've built, and, um, and this is the organization that we have found that, that, that matches this problem. So it starts with ingest. This is where we hook up to as many broadcasters and as many sources directly as possible. We have relationships with um, broadcasters uh, around the world, and we have relationships with uh, aggregators around the world, and we have um, uh, technical relationships with them. We have, we're, they have their servers connected to our servers, sending us data in real time, uh, updating our, our servers with the current technical and marketing data about uh, the stations that they represent. That's our ingest. That's where we just pull in massive amounts of data from around the world. Um, and then we have what we call our matcher. And this is where when that data comes in, you got a warehouse and you got to figure out which bin do you put the data in. And this is where the data science comes in. And generally speaking, this is not done in real time. You know, when we take on a new source or we go into a new geography, we, we figure out matching and we say, okay, this ID from this source means this ID from that source and it goes in that bin. And uh, so the matcher is running and organizing and putting the data where it needs to go. The selector is, um, what is operating in real time. So you'll have a, a car in the field and they'll send a query that could uh, include, it has to include latitude and longitude so we know where you are. Uh, but it could also include, uh, if it has a background tuner, it could tell us all the frequencies it can, it can get, the PI codes of the broadcast that it, it, can, that it can see, um, you know, the, the, the uh, ensemble IDs for, for the DAB uh, multiplex that it's on. And they send that to us. And, um, using that information, we go gather all of the relevant data to what that car is, can, can see in terms of radio, and we push back a station data object that includes you know, anything they need to, to, to put together a display, and we call that the live guide. Um, you can see clean across the market. We'll tell you marketing information, logos, slogans. Um, we'll tell you what's playing to the extent that we know it. Um, so you can see there's some album covers there. There's some s station logos there. Uh, that was the UK last night, uh, DAB. All right, so this is all happening in real time. We're sucking in massive amounts of information from around the world. We're putting it up on the shelf. And when a car company says, I'm here, here's what I can see. Tell me what's going on. We go pull it off the shelf and we deliver it uh, within 200 milliseconds to that car. And we're doing this on 170,000 broadcasts for 70,000 uh, radio stations around the world. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And then you go to your steady state where you're actually listening to a station. And, and there the, 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 the automobile can subscribe to a queue. Uh, we, have a, we have a push messaging system that we maintain. And uh, the broadcasters, when they push us information, when their program changes, we push, you can subscribe to that queue and we push it out to cars. If the song changes, we push out a message to all cars subscribe to that and say, new album art, come get it. Um, so this is the, the, the machine that we build that, that, that maps all of that stuff and delivers all this information, collects it and delivers it to cars. Um, so you know we're, we're merging our domain knowledge of FM broadcast, radio broadcast with internet technologies and delivering a compelling experience. But we have to do this without consuming a lot of data because if it gets up to streaming, you know, to 64 kilobits, 120 kilobits per second, we're done. May as well stream it. So um, just by way of reference, our service, all of that that I described, delivers to the car. Uh, between 1.3 kilobits per second and 2.2 kilobits per second. We deliver all that metadata for that, uh, for that experience. And that depends on the features. The 1.3 is the features that I showed you. 2.2, you start to add what we call live presets. So your presets are showing what's playing on all those stations. That album art drives it up a bit. <clears throat> um, <coughs> um, to do this, Technically, the challenge is there is a very careful API design. You know, if you come from mobile, if you come from the web, and you hit the gigabit per second that we were talking about, you don't care. You could be sloppy with your API. You, as much data as you want to exchange, and if you think they may want the data, give them the data. Who cares? Data's free. 
But when you're talking in this application where the car company is paying for it and you're trying to keep yourself well below these figures, it really does matter. And you have to think carefully about what the uh, API design in, what's, what's the, what's the uh, flow? How do client interact with the server? How do you, what's the least information we can collect to, to, to provide the service? What's the least information we can deliver to let uh, a bunch of implementations, uh, cars implement in a bunch of different ways? And how can we be fast and responsive, given that you have all this stuff going on in the, in, in the back office of pulling all this data in and trying to get it off the shelf fast? So the API design is critical to, to, to accomplishing that. Um, and then you have to also look at other techniques. Um, for example, you want all your requests and you want all your responses to be, uh, to be compressed. You, you know, so we, we, Because a lot of this is just URLs and text and it's very compressible. And you want to deliver the things that aren't compressible separately. So we, we first push out URLs, and then the client can go retrieve images, because images don't compress well, certainly not with zip. So that's the, that's the heart of the system. But at the end of the day, the broadcasters are our customer. And um, broadcasters are, are very, very protective of the relationship between them and the, and the listener. And um, they don't take well to people getting in between them and the listener. And so we're very careful about making clear to broadcasters that we're not trying to alter their marketing. We're not trying to alter their access to their listeners in any way. We're just trying to help them provide a better product to the, to the listener. And we're trying to deliver value to the car company. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, one of the ways that we deliver on this is we provide a dashboard. And this is important because it's not your data. That's one of the things we always remind ourselves. It's, it's not our data. All we're doing is organizing it and, and uh, delivering it to cars. And we provide a dashboard that allows broadcasters to manage their own data. They can see all the data we have from them in their, in their system. They can take themselves out of our system. They can turn some features on and off in our system. And ultimately, they have complete control over how they look in our system. And uh, for you know, the big broadcasters around the world, that's very, very important. To the mom and pops, it's less, uh, less important. So that's the big picture. Um, in summary, metadata is very important to delivering a, a rich experience. And, um, and there's a lot of metadata available it's, if you can organize it and you can deliver it to where it needs to be. Cars, that's where people listen to radio. That's where it's relevant. Um, and the um, techniques that have been developed on the internet side of technology are relevant to this problem. And you're, you're going to address many of those same problems, but there's going to be some unique problems. And um, we've come up with some new solutions uh, to those problems. And uh, in, it's, a global pro it's a global product. It's a global problem. And one of the things about the broadcast industry is that they tend to be, uh, think, of, think geographically. The American broadcasters have interactions with the rest of the world, but most of it is, is, is they think of the US broadcast industry as the world. And for us, that's just not the case. We have to deliver a global product and meet the needs of broadcasters around the world, big and small. So that's it. Any questions? A lot of what you're supplying is uh, copyrighted. And right. therefore, uh, it's up through, some, through some sort of mechanism, somebody has to pay the licensing fees on this. Is, uh, how is this service structured? Will there be a charge to the broadcaster that participates in your service? Oh, and by the way, do they have the right to participate or not participate, I guess? So uh, how does it work out with the broadcaster licensing and that kind of stuff? Uh, very good question. Thank you. Um, it, there's, there's multiple aspects of that. Uh, with regard to like album images and artist images, absolutely copyrighted. And um, we take a license from a, uh, a license. Like, for example, we license Getty Images. And we're delivering artist images to supplement the, uh, the broadcast. We license that. We pay for that. And that's a cost of doing business for us. Um, with regard to logos, which is the copyrighted material of the broadcasters, um, we, we kind of handle that in, in, in two ways. Uh, for the major broadcasters, the sources that we're getting it from are either directly from the broadcaster themselves or through an aggregator that they're a voluntary participant of, iHeart or, or Radio Player or some such aggregator. And so the licensing flows you know, directly to us through that. 
Um, the other approach that we take is it's just not realistic that you're going to reach out to 73,000 broadcasters around the world and you know probably 72,000 of them don't care to hear from you anyway. So um, what we do provide is an opt-out feature where you know if they are not happy with us providing that metadata, they can either change it or they can take themselves out of our system. There's a tick box, you're out. So you know we we think that we're trying to strike a, you know we're, we're addressing it directly and and we're trying to come up with you know a commercially reasonable way of of doing it. Who pays the freight? Who pays the freight? You know with these services there's always two freights. Um, one is the last mile, right? And then the other one is the the back office stuff. We pay the back office, and uh, either the car company or the the consumer brings in their own uh, device to play the, to pay the last mile. So our business model is we charge the, the car company. Okay. You know, this goes back to our HD. We're HD radio, man, right? So um, we have these relationships with the car companies. We have an established business model that everybody's comfortable with. But the difference here is that we actually have a cost. We have an ongoing cost. And we're promising to deliver this service for the life of a car when we sign it up. And we get a fee once, and we have to deliver this. And so you know, we have to make sure that we're accounting for this properly, and we're keeping reserves and all those things, too.